Uh, hello, everyone. Hello. Good night. Uh, thanks a lot for your time. Thanks a lot for being here in this last talk. It's 7 p.m., so a little bit late. And I appreciate your time. Um, I'm Alejandro Hernandez. I will be presenting uh, some interesting stuff that I have found in EEG technologies this last year. Um, I would like to quickly introduce myself. I'm a, a consultant from IOActive. It's a security company. Uh, I do fuzzing. I love programming. I'm, I'm, I'm a security enthusiast. I've been for 12 years now in the security industry, in the hacking scene. Uh, I come from a background. Uh, I have a background from computer systems engineering. I didn't study any any medical re related career, or doctor, or neuroscience, or whatever. So uh, I really apologize if I say something wrong technically in this because I started from the scratch, from just computer uh, a computer background in this new topic for me, right? Um, so in this talk, I'm gonna quickly start talking about neuroscience 101, what is EEG, what are brain waves, and then we can jump into the insecurity aspects I have found in design, in cryptography, in authentication, and just the conclusions of this. Uh, this is not an invasive brain computer interface talk, so don't expect to be Johnny Mnemonic after this talk. So, so you remember, uh, Kino Reeves using his brain as a hard drive, right, right? So this is not invasive. Sorry, if you expect to have a hard drive in your brain after this, this is not the talk. Okay, why this talk? You might wonder, what, why brain waves? What's, what's the purpose of this, right? Nowadays, we care about information security, your mobile security, your car hacking, your, your internet of things. We put more attention in security of your coffee machine in your house or your fridge, but what about your bill signals? In this case, let's say uh, EEG. What is the security in the acquisition, in the processing, in the storage, and the transmission of your brain waves to, to dif the different digital uh, mediums? Uh, this is very important for me. EEG tech is being adopted more and more. This is not only in clinical use nowadays. We will see some examples in a few minutes. Uh, why is this becoming an important technology and we should and we must put security in that part. And sure, brain stuff is cool, isn't it? We've seen like a lot of movies recently, brain computer interfaces. So for me, playing a little bit with the brain and brain waves is very interesting. Okay, in order to understand the EEG technology, we need to understand where the waves come from, right? So basically, we have the outer layer of your or our brain. This is the cortex. And in there, there's many, uh, many neurons, many connections between neurons, transmitting information, chemical information, electronic, uh, electric information. And this information depends on the different region, regions of the brain. We have different lobes, the parietal lobes. Every lobe has a different function, every part of your brain uh, is connected, is related to any of these uh, uh, different uh, things like uh, sensory association, the smelling, the tasting, the motor uh, things of your, of your body. Um, neurons, they are connected between each other through electrical signals, chemical signals, and some of these signals, they are escaped between this synapse uh, activity. And this, this is the things that we catch with EEG, with, with electroencephalography technologies, right? So the synaptic activity is affected by external things, like if you have uh, depression or if you are on drugs, on cocaine or caffeine or alcohol, your brain waves are different than from a baby sleeping, for example, right? Uh, in one year studying this new topic for me, I really understood why in the media, why in the books, why in, in, on Discovery Channel they say that the brain, the human brain is super complex. After reading some books and a lot of articles on the internet, I found like really complex information there. So thank you neuroscience, neuroscience. they're re doing really cool stuff in this area. Okay. What are brain waves? The brain waves, we need first to understand what's the difference between invasive and non-invasive uh, computer interfaces. Uh, invasive is just uh, an implant here 
This is the cortex of your brain. This is a, an electronic implant. This is invasive, and non-invasive is, is this electrode on your scalp, scalp outside uh, from your head. This is an active, uh, an invasive brain-computer interface. You have the implantation here in your head, and it's easier to get information from your brain because you are getting information straight from the synaptic activity, right? Uh, this is one of the most famous cases, BrainGate. is the first woman uh, controlling a, a mechanical arm, just thinking of the movements of the, of the arm. On the other hand, we have the non-invasive technologies. The most famous one is EEG. EEG stands for electroencephalography. And basically are the electrodes on the, in the scalp. And it looks like this. Basically, it's the representation over time of the synaptic act activity of your, of your neurons, right? Uh, represented uh, uh, over time. Now, this is a very easy to use method. It's been used for in the clinical uh, and the medical industry for years, for decades, in order to, to, to find different things that I will show you in a, in a bit. However, the EEG technologies are susceptible to, 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 um, to noise. I really like this quote from this famous neuroscience neuroscientist, John Donoghue, Donog, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, sorry. But uh, he said that current brain technologies is like trying to listen to a conversation in a football stadium from a blimp. A blimp is like, you know, like this balloon like flying over the stadium. So that difficult is because your synaptic activity has to go through to the school, to different layers. So in order to get a good EEG quality, you need amplifiers in between, you need encoders in between, filters, etc. Okay. This is, these are the like main frequencies in brain waves. Every frequency are re is relaxed with different mind states. For example, the, the lower frequencies, theta, are for people who are completely sleeping or are really calm. On the other hand, you have like beta activity, which is when you're awake, when you're putting attention, like all you now. Thank you for your beta waves. <laughs> well, there are some uh, standards in the industry, like this one, 1020 systems to put the electrodes in your scalp. This is very famous. So remember, the brain waves are analog. If you want to process it in computers, we need the ones and, and, and zeros, right? So we need to digitalize through amplifiers and and converters. After we have the signals, they look like this. This is a real EEG recording. Every line is a is an electrode in your brain. Uh, you can find the patterns. I mean, not you, not me. Neuroscience people who study this because the things that I see here, I don't understand. I only I only see waves. But for example, there are doctors in neuroscience. I, I got a book by this book. It's, this is the this is basically an atlas, and inside you might find interesting uh, brain waves. Like I found, for example, a kid who had a lithium toxicity, and you can see his brain waves acting uh, in a really weird, uh, a really weird uh, way. I'll show you. Okay. Uh, this is the, the book that I showed you. Now, how do you acquire the brain waves? You can buy commercial um, commercial uh, hardware. I was talking with with, with her uh, a little bit uh, a few minutes ago, and she's agreed with me that. It's very expensive hardware that is being used in, in hospitals in, in the medical uh, industry nowadays, up to thousand dollars. However, there are, this technology is being adopted and it's being implemented in these small devices. This is a mind mind wave. It's one of the cheapest one. It's super simple, one hundred bucks, and you have one electrode in your brain. I'll show you in a bit. 
on the other hand, you have the do-it-yourself. You have open source software, and there are many cool applications out there, like really good stuff out there. Open EEG, Open BCI. Um, this is the first demonstration. is very quick. It's not in complex. It's just the visualization, visualization of, of the brain waves. So I'm ner I'm very nervous, and I'm sweating a little bit. So I I'm not sure if it will get my brain activity now. It's turned on, but. I need to meditate a little bit, one sec. I have gray band mother inside, so no worries. Okay, here we go. So this is basically my brain waves now. I will blink. You see the, the please watch the, the, the white line. When I blink, I will be blinking very continuously in three, two, one. Check at the waves. So my brain waves are acting there in real time, right? There is people doing really cool research with this, uh, playing with these different uh, thresholds here, meditation, attention, I will show you in a bit. This is just a funny application. This is nothing serious. This is just to show you how, how it looks like. Now, I really want you to put attention in the following slides. This is, I think, the main purpose of the talk. How people is implementing, is using these technologies now. Okay, this is the most used, the most uh, used use in the medical industry to diagnose different uh, disorders, sleeping disorders, um, narcolepsy, etc. I'll show you this quick demo here. This is a real application from a hospital. This patient this is a kid. He has connected like 32 uh, electrodes uh, and also two ones AKGs. AKGs is electrocardiograms. So this video recording is EEG technology connected and synchronized with the EEG recorder. So when I play, you will be seeing his real brain waves. He's about to have a seizure now. Look at his brain waves are getting really bad. The green things there, these are markers, are notes by, neuros, by doctors, so different doctors can see what's happening and where it started, where the seizure started, right? So this is the main purpose and the origin of these technologies. Now, uh, there are people doing clinical research to put EEG data on the cloud to find patterns, to, to, to feed algorithms and to find patterns to do better diagnostics on different things. Uh, there are people controlling prostheses with EEG. Arduino connected prostheses controlled by EEG. This, I really like this example. Brain to brain interface. So these guys from the University of Washington. Uh, there is one person sending their brain waves through the internet 
and there is another person receiving these waves to a TMS machine. TMS stands for transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's basically a hardware that stimulates certain, par certain parts of your brain, so you do certain things. In, in this case, he's sending the waves and he's receiving this through the internet and pressing a button unconsciously, right? Uh, there is people studying uh, brain waves on, ba on babies in London, controlling stuff, controlling drones, like this guy. There are some Japanese people controlling cars now with brain waves connecting to the, to the car. Uh, in security, we know passwords. What about past thoughts? There is people doing research on this because they think that brain waves are unique to each individual. What could possibly go wrong if you can do reply attacks, right? Okay, I'll, I'll show you in a bit. There is people using EEG to identify cybersecurity threats in companies. Military use. Now they are using uh, soldiers' thoughts for to launch computer commands without human interaction, using their brain waves. Uh, this is a long-term research by the U.S. Army as well. They are showing to the soldiers different images. So they just see the images and they can find threatening scenarios after they put the results in a machine learning algorithm. They just see the pictures and perhaps in the future they will use this information to find p potential threatening scenarios in the, in the, in the field. Uh, for relaxation, which is, this is called neurofeedback, so you can uh, control your breathing, control your, 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 your mind. There are people like this Mexican, Nani Garzalao, she's doing really cool stuff with art and EEG. Uh, she's doing art with some speakers, water and her brain waves. Uh, this is a, an important case. Um, I'm not sure about laws or regulations, but now this murderer, this criminal, uh, his defense, he ordered to do a quantitative EEG. So the result of an EEG scan could, uh, could affect the output of the, the, the outcome of the trial, right? People in video games, people doing neuro neuromarketing to predict movie success. Uh, Neuroware, this is uh, it's a really funny and really interesting thing. It's basically wearables with an EEG device. It has to be in Japan, right? <laughs> so, based on their emotions, on their... The EEG device is just basically measuring her attention levels or her relaxation levels, right? What about the 21st century Tinder? It's like connecting people through... <laughs> that's, that's real. That's, that's completely real. What about surfers in the coast of Mexico doing neuroscience scanning brainwaves? Sending your brainwaves to the cloud. Uh, Neuromore is a new application that takes your brainwaves and uploading it to the, to the cloud for further research, for different purposes. So... What possible attack scenarios do we have here? We can do, theoretically, now, because the technology is new, theoretically, we could do replay attacks with, to control things, drones, processes, or to bypass authentication if we can do replay attacks. What about if there is an attacker in the hospital network and you can unauthorized update the record of a criminal or a patient in the network? because of the lack of encryption, of authentication, right? Or what about, as there are spammers now trading with thousands of email addresses, what about trading EG data for behavioral analysis in neuromarketing? I just had these random ideas, but this, you know, like, it could be, it could be they could be real scenarios in five, in five years. Uh, or what about client-side attacks? Like in this software that I showed you a few minutes ago, if you corrupt some data, some metadata of the brainwave, say, files, 
uh, you can exploit, or you can find bugs in client side uh, applications. Okay, the first one, design. And there are some applications that include security in the design of their products, of their software. They put authentication, encryption. For example, I quickly checked Neuromore and I found that they are uploading the data to a necessary channel, which is good, right? But on the other hand, uh, in the 90% of the manuals and the specifications and brochures that I read from many different vendors, many different companies, I look for specific keywords like secure to find words like security or secure or crypto or authentication or password. And in no one of them, 90%, they, they are not implementing security in their design, right? If we go to the further, if we go further in encryption, in transit, many technologies, many vendors are using TCP IP as their communication uh, channel. So brain waves on the wire, what could possibly go wrong again? If you go to Google and you just look for neuro acquisition or your product name and TCP port, you will find different uh, products supporting TCP IP. These applications, for example, Siesta is an ambulatory EEG device in hospitals, so the patient has a Wi-Fi um, enabled application with this high tech security web, wireless, whatever. Could you imagine a really attack scenario there? Just someone cracking the Wi-Fi easily and sniffing that network there. It's, I'm, I'm not sure if this product has encryption or not, but in many, many vendors put this information, like this technology enables your computer and all the computers in the LAN to easily connect to this and blah, blah, blah. They don't mention security or authentication or something, right? There are many different products. Uh, this is a specific case, the first case, Neuroelectrics. is a company based in Barcelona. They are doing really cool stuff uh, in this area. And in their manual, you will see that this, this is the software. This is the hardware. And when the software connects to the hardware, this middleware software opens a TCP port, one, two, three, four. And when it's ready, you just connect to the port and you will be receiving the information on the channels in a raw data, right? That means that if someone is connected to the to the to this cap, anyone else could connect to this port and just receiving their brain waves, right? Because there is no encryption in in, in, in here. Uh, this is a library, it's a very used library nowadays for different applications, LSL. I read a little bit of their source source code and basically they're sending and receiving data through binary, um, through, through, through binary uh, variables. I mean, they're just sending the data on the wire, they're not encrypting, they're not decrypting. And time for a demo. In the following demo, I will be using this very old and unmaintained software, it's NeuroServer, it's very old, but it's still in use nowadays because it's being adopted by some other applications like BrainBay. Basically, um, it's a server on TCP IP using the EDF format. I will talk about EDF in a bit. The normal scenario is this. I will be using this software, the, the MindWave device, and I will be sending my brain waves to the EEG server. Remember the IP address, 149, the host named Daria, this is the server. After that, there will be an attacker in the middle. This is another virtual machine. Is the IP60, right? Since it's over TCP IP, that means that, you know, TCP IP doesn't have security in design, authentication or encryption. So with a basic R poisoning that all of you know how to do really easily, you can basically sniff brain waves, right? I'll show you. So here I have my ARP table, not poisoned yet. Uh, in this computer, this is the neuro server.
this is the attacker computer. So now the man in the middle attack is taking place. Now you see they are poisoned. This is another pr pr uh, program, it's called Brain Bay. So you can design different signalings and different, different, different things. In this case, I have this COM reader connecting to the COM5, which is my Bluetooth device, talking to the, to the mind wave, right? So I'm going to connect to the device. Now it's connected. It's ready to receive waves. Okay, so the output of this channel, I will send this output to this basic oscilloscope just to visualize the, the waves. But on the other hand, I will have the TCP sender. The TCP sender is sending my brain waves to the neuro server, which is this IP address, patient name, Alejandro Hernandez, and some extra information like sampling rates, etc. So let's see, the neuro server is ready, and I start the session. So these are my brain waves now. I will connect to the server, connect it, and I will start sending my brain waves. 3,000 packets, many packets sent, neuro server received my information here. So it works, right? But here the attacker is receiving a copy. This is just the protocol of the neuro server protocol. There are different protocols, there are different, different file formats. And these, these OKs are from neuro server. It's not encrypted. These, these numbers, these minus numbers, these are my brain waves, my signals, my going back and forth, etc. So this is just a demonstration, a POC, that if there is no encryption in the product, it's very easy just to do many intermediate attacks and to receive and decode in the proper file format or protocol. It's very easy. All you need to know is the information. This information is, is, is going through the EDF file format, so it's quite simple to, to, to decode this information. Okay, it was the first demo for encryption. Now, encryption in REST. In REST, EG data is in files, like in, in PDF files or Word documents, there is no encryption. So, also, I was wondering what about the cloud? The cloud? How is how are these companies protecting your brain waves in the cloud, right? And I had this idea to use Shodan and looking for NetBeos shares on the internet, just looking for the specific products names like Brain, uh, brain Vision or NeuroServer. And yeah, there is people sharing brain waves there. What about authentication? If you don't have authentication, like, okay, we need authentication between uh, first, in, uh, when you connect to a port, you need to supply something before start receiving the information, right? Also, there should be authentication between the acquisition device and the other point, for example, between the, this device and the drone. Otherwise, there will be anyone else just connecting through the drone, theoretically, and taking control of, of it. If there is no authentication, right, there should be something in between, I don't know, a password, a hash, something, an authentication mechanism. Um, this is another case, it's the same that I described to you before. You just connect to the TCP port and it works. And the following demo is changing the patient name in a main intermediate attack uh, in the same scenario. So I will send the patient name, Alejandro Hernandez, but if there is an attacker in between, in the following demo, I will be changing my name for just John Connor. In the neuro server, we'll be receiving this name. This is a proof of concept. This is just an ASCII change, but you can modify brain waves. Remember, brain waves are just are just bytes. Remember, they are just bytes. <laughs> so imagine that 
you are sending brainwaves to a server and which have which high spikes or low spikes, and there is an attacker in between modifying this information to to send fake brainwaves to the to the to the other point, right? It works. So in this example, I will run a neuro server again. And in the attacker side, I will modify the, the hacking tool, the man in the middle tool, in order to modify it on the fly this information. This is the filter. It's a simple filter for the man in the middle tool. I compile the filter. Okay, so I start the session. This is, our, this is my brain waves. I open the TCP sender. Look, patient name, Alejandro Hernandez. I'm going to send this information to this server. I connect to it, and I start sending the information. It's working, right? Sending the packets and everything. However, the server received John Connor. And the attacker has like, yeah, pension name replaced. This is the hacking tool, right? This is the attacker, the man in the middle. He could change the raw brain waves, the patient names, or any other information in between, right? So this is because of the lack of authentication. Now, passing to the next topic, resilience. Resilience basically is the ability to support or to recover from, from adversity, in this case, denial of service attacks. Uh, I was impressed when I had this idea, using 90s techniques, still, and it's still killing 21st century technologies. Seriously, just a force so creating sockets, 10,000 connections, TCP IP. You wouldn't believe it, but most of the application I tested, they, they, they died. So in the following demos, this will be the scenario. I'll have the brain device here sending to the server, and it's over TCP. There are many clients. In this case, could be I don't know in the hospital a monitor showing in real time uh, the brain waves, or a doctor or a physician with a handheld connecting to the server, seeing the patient data in real time as well. But if it crashes, no one of the clients will be able to to to, to see the information, right? So for the following demo, I will be using this software, OpenVive. It's acquisition server remote denial of service. Uh, this is a software for real-time neurosciences and brain-computer interfaces. Okay, this is the acquisition server. I have to say that I will be using the NeuroSky mindset driver that is connected on the port COM5. Okay. And that I will be receiving this information, the, the electrode information. I connect to the driver. I start. Now I'm, these are my brain signals. It's just saying that it's ready, it's working, right? All you have to do is connect to the TCP port 1024, what is this listening? And I will be using the second part of the software. It's just a designer. Like in Brain Bay, like something like Brain Bay, you have different objects here, like file readers, signals, uh, process, uh, processors. Uh, in this case, I have a, an acquisition client. 
it's connecting to the port 10, uh, 1024 and it's sending the output to one oscilloscope quickly. One second. Okay, here we go. This is my real time signals. This is the server working, accepting new connections, but if we launch a basic attack, check out the signal, still working, right? Now I have a generic port stressor.exe connecting to this host, this port, and I will be doing 1,000 connect, 10,000 connections. This is a 90s technique. After a few seconds, boom. cannot connect. This cannot connect anymore to the server. It's just stopped. So no one else could connect to the server. And this just died. The application died. So this is a software bug. It's a denial of service attack. So it worked. I have another example, Neuroelectrics. This is from another company. I have this recorded. So TCP server, lot of clients here, cannot connect, cannot connect anymore. And it's doing the same attack in a different port, in a different TCP port that is listening this, this application. And in no one of the ports, you will be able to connect anymore. So at the application just hang. You have to close it because just, just hang. And this is a proof of my bad English. Hang, hang, I didn't remember the, the word. Another example, NeuroServer. This is a malformed EDF header that I, that I did. I read the specification, which is very simple. You just have to send a malformed packet. Um, I killed the server by triggering this assertion in programming. This is why it's a good idea. It's a good practice not to include your assertion in your final products, any kind of software. You all know this, right? So it was very easy to, to, to kill this. So for this, I just write the quick proof of concept code in Python. This is NeuroServer. Uh, I just open it with GDB, which is a uh, debugger for Linux, so I can see what happened. And the code is very simple, as you can see. All you have to do is just send a malformed uh, EDF. Uh, NeuroServer remote denial of service, sending the malformed packet. Neural server should be dead now. Connecting, neural server is down. Yep. A board core dumped. Denial of service. This is another one. It's a memory corruption vulnerability. Um, I don't have time. I have just five minutes more. So I will go quick, quickly. is the same, a denial of service attack. You have a six segmentation fault, and with GDB I was able to see that, that it was um, because of the mem set. It's a boundary checking. It's a normal security bug, a software bug. This topic is very interesting, Tower of Babel, of the file formats. Uh, perhaps many of you know the story of Tower of Babel. Um, basically, in, in this, the story of this tower is that humanity, we all spoke the same language. And the humans wanted to reach the sky, reach, wanted to reach God to talk. So they started to create the tower. 
But with, when God realized, realized that, he was like, no, I don't want you to come here. So he changed uh, their languages of many of them. This is the origin of the languages. That's, this is why we speak like Spanish, English, uh, broken English. <laughs> and yes, remember, the origin of the EEG technologies is from from clinical perspective, from the medi medicine perspective. So there are different vendors, many different companies doing products, many different uh, developers. So there are many compatible formats. Most of them use proprietary formats. There were some efforts to do standardization, but this back in '92 is an old format. Uh, I spent. It took me weeks. Seriously, it took me weeks to go through brochures, manuals, specification to do this Excel uh, document. So this helped me a lot for my research in order to identify which is the most used file format in EEG technology. So my conclusion was that EDF, most of the products support EDF and EDS plus, and of course they're proprietary formats, right? So that said, I just went and played with different, with, with the EDF format. And remember, parsing is parsing. It's just like parsing any other any other things, like parsing a PDF document, parsing a picture, are basically bytes in data structure. That means that if you don't put security, you have the same risks as in, in any other kind of software. You are prone to buffer overflows, uh, arithmetic calculation, especially here, because here you have a lot of multiplications, a lot of divisions between frequencies, between number of channels. There are many, many arithmetic problems here. And however, the attack surface is very re reduced because this file format is not mainstream. It's not you are not sharing EG data with your friend, right? Uh, but still, the, prob the problem is there. And this is just like this feeling that I have that I think that developers in this industry come from a different different background. It's not like us, like that we come from, from IT, from an IT background, that we know some secure, secure programming. Perhaps they are not fully aware of secure programming and they are still using many string copy, the basic. I'm not telling that they are insecure, it was just a quick look. They are really good programmers. Their code is amazing. It's really good, but still, there are some um, some uh, box, uh, some uh, insecure uh, functions. But I haven't had time to go through them and check if they are false positives or if they are security box. So I did trivial fuzzing, just basic fuzzing, dumb fuzzing using Mangle.c from by Ilja Van Spruntel. He's a colleague of mine. From, from IOactive. I also use Microsoft Minifus. Um, the test cases, there is this network, Fisionet, is just uh, a bunch of files from different formats, EDF files, from, div from real people, from patients for research purposes. So you are able to download different data sets from here to play with. Um, and I, this is my fuzzing. Um, I don't know how to say it's schedule, my fossil results, I did different, I played with different samples, different fossils, different headers, according to the specification, uh, percentage and output. And it was not fun. You know why? Because in the first test cases, most application broke. It's not, it's, fossil is not interesting unless you leave your fossil working for hours, right? It's like, and in the end you come the next morning and it's like, hell yeah. I found a bug, but what, this was not the case. I found like many segmentation faults, many potential memory corruption bo uh, bugs. I will show you quickly some demonstration in some commercial products and some uh, open source software. This is one of the most used application inside too by Persist. It's one of the most complete applications. It has like a lot of file formats supporting from different proprietary uh, vendors, from different vendors. And yeah, so this is Sig Viewer. This is a sleeping by EEG data. This is a basic. So you basically open a file, sleeping, it's loading and it works, right? If you open a corrupted file. This one is FOST. 
boom, it died. Let me see another one. Uh, this one, still eight. This is another famous uh, product. We'll open EDF files. And this is also fast. It's opening. Boom, it died, it crashed. There are many segmentation faults, there are many vulnerabilities in parsing here. The bugs are still there, you know? But as I said before, the attack surface is very reduced. This is very important research. This is not my research. I just, but it's worth to mention. It. It's like these guys from from Berkeley and Oxford and Geneva, they did this amazing research on the feasibility of side channel attacks in brain computer interfaces. So basically, from their population, they put uh, they measured the brain waves from different people, and they showed to these people different pictures from different banks, and. They were just watching the pictures, for, for example, bank A, bank B, bank C. But unconsciously, your brain waves behave differently if you see the logo of your bank, or if you see your pin code, or if you see people that you know, or your neighborhood in a map, right? And the outcome of this amazing research is this, that the entropy of the private information is decreased on the average by approximately 50 to 40% 40, 40 compared to random guessing attacks. So that's really, really cool, right? Uh, now, if we jump to regulatory compliance best practices for EEG, who is in charge of it? HIPA or I, I'm not the reg regulations guy, so I don't, I don't have any idea. I just found this information on, on the internet. Also, the FDA, the Food and Drugs Administration, is working together with the cybersecurity community to, to improve. Uh, the security in these technologies. Uh, I also went to the to this website. It's some guidelines by the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. However, the guidelines are dated 2006, 2008. And for example, in this one, guidelines for recording EEG on digital media, they are still mentioning magnetic storage. So, in conclusion, of all these things. Definitely, we need to put more security in mind for brain signals treatment, in acquisition, in storage, in transmission. Uh, we need to put more efforts in file format standardization, more secure programming practices. We need to create or update the best practices for, for, for EEG. Uh, we have a new terrain to play with no networking and parsing. If you have a drone and you're using it for research, just play with some replay attacks, try to sniff the data. What if you save your brain waves and you reply this to, I don't know, to your processes? Would it work? Definitely, it would work. If you don't have authentication and encryption, it will work. Uh, you need to test your medical devices and so forth if you are a vendor. Uh, this is further research. It's just some other random ideas that I had. What if you scan the internet with ZMAP and you scan for the ports used by non EG acquisition software and hardware? You will find if you, I, 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 I have found a couple of them. I, I won't tell you. I don't know, I, I was just sniffing frame waves from someone in the internet. I was just getting the, the signals from there. It worked, it works. Or I was thinking the other day, uh, let's say that 10 years ago, no one was speaking, was talking about um, SCADA or industrial security. Like only a few guys were talking about like SCADA hacking and blah, 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 10 years ago. Nowadays we have physical firewalls that goes with deep packing inspection through layer seven uh, applications in SCADA, for example, Modbus. So they can go inside the protocol and detect potential attacks, potential malformed data. So what if we have the same BIOS signals, not only for brains, like for other kind of signals from your body. BIOS signals are firewalls or IPS with the same level of inspection. 
in in the future. I don't know. I can imagine a future in hospitals where there are firewalls for this, that all the data back and forth from, from your body to the servers are going in the proper way. Um, this is it. I hope you like the presentation. Thank you.